All right, the session has just started recording. Everyone joining in, please do keep your mics muted and your webcams muted. Uh, our series uh, will be the fourth of the session uh, presented by Internet, uh, HCC Entrepreneur and Resident. And uh, Austin, thank you so much for making the time available today to share. Uh, about stakeholder engagement. Uh, myself, uh, I'm the, my name is Ravi Brimbert. I'm the Director for uh, Student Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Southwest College uh, of Houston Community College. Uh, glad everyone is here. Uh, for questions, please do uh, type them in the chat. Uh, currently, the chat will only allow you to share with, uh, with me. And what I'll do, Austin, is I'll read out the chat questions uh, when uh, you ask me uh, or um, near the end of the presentation, whichever you prefer, Austin. I'm good either way. Okay, uh, good. Well, yeah, maybe we'll break it up. I've got a couple spots in there. We can break it up. Thank you. Got it. Okay, so with that, Austin, I am going to hand it over to you uh, to, to lead us into stakeholder engagement. Thank you so much. Hey, Bobby, thank you so much for that uh, kind uh, intro, and welcome to our guest this morning. So uh, as Ravi mentioned, this is the fourth in our installment, and uh, here's just a little bit about me. In my day job, I'm a certified business coach working with executive leadership teams of uh, small and medium-sized businesses and working primarily on their growth strategies. Uh, my Pay It Forward work includes working with uh, exclusively with Houston Community College, where I'm a, uh, a senior advisor in the business plan competition as well as a trainer. I deliver um, uh, modules on sales, marketing, business model development, and, and pitching. Um, I have a long corporate experience. Uh, corporate, great place to be from, but uh, in those roles, had various roles, but um, the ones that I had the most fun in were those of uh, running a corporate strategy function, a business unit leader for about 1,700 employees, and then the last part of my corporate career, I was in uh, business development. So. Let's move on here to the and get to the meat of the presentation. So our goal, not just for this this particular webinar, but for this entire series, is to help business owners, business leaders, to accelerate out of the pandemic. I think we've got some good news here from our governor here in the last uh, couple of days here that we are starting to uh, open up and ease the stay-at-home orders. So, um, you know, uh, if you have a restaurant owner, that means you, you can't, you can't uh, fill up your restaurant. You've got to stay at 25% uh, capacity for the next few, uh, for the next few weeks. And, of course, there will be other organizations that have similar roles. But the key thing here is I want us to start shifting our focus from uh, being at home to focus on how do we excel, not, not just come out of the pandemic, but accelerate out. And so we'll talk about some key ideas and concepts as we move through the presentation. Okay, so just to, just to go back uh, to revisit where we've been so far, uh, last week we uh, had a, a conversation on sales. And uh, the emphasis there was on keeping a basically a very simple, straightforward sales process. We use the analogy of the sales staircase because any good, effective uh, sales effort is, uh, requires a methodic step-by-step -step process, and we walk through the seven or eight steps there. Uh, we, took, we use the, um, the um, ask the combination uh, picture there, encouraging you that in your sales process that you, you ask um, high-quality, open-ended questions to really, really get at the needs of your existing customers and are your prospective customers. Because the, re the reality of it is if we're not able to uncover any pain or uncover an opportunity that a, a, a prospect is trying to capture, there's not going to be op an opportunity for us to sell anything. Then we talked about the four green lights, and those are just kind of the four situations that need to be present before a client will make, move forward and make a sale. And those are there's got to be a, be a budget for, the, for the, the product or service. There's got to be a need. Uh, there's got to be uh, – we have to be talking to the right person. They have the authority to make the purchase decision, and then we have to understand their timing. Is it the next 30 to 60 days, or is it something well beyond that? And then as we have that opportunity, we land the customer, we, and we begin to serve. We must serve them, uh, we must serve them appropriately. 
Okay? So that was our summary from last week. So as I had mentioned previously, this what we're doing here, this is a, a webinar series that is going to support a, a workshop series that we're going to be offering, are offering in conjunction with the, with the HCC uh, Corporate College. So here are the eight basic modules that we'll cover. So in the webinar series, we've talked about mindset. We'll, we'll talk about strategic planning. We've talked about marketing and sales. And um, we'll cover these in much more de in-depth detail for those of you who um, en enroll in the workshop series. And I strongly encourage you to do that if there's interest. The, um, the uh, corporate college is, has some very, very attractive uh, offerings, and there's for, for most business owners uh, should be able to attend this uh, workshop series at little or no cost. So let's jump into our topic for today, which is stakeholders. And stakeholders, just real briefly, uh, just uh, my definition, our definition for today is, it's those people that are around us and organizations that are around us that, are, that help contribute to the success of our, either our careers and or our uh, business enterprises. Okay, the problem. Always a problem, right? So the problem is, you know, no business is an island. Uh, we exist out there, particularly those of us in a city like the size of Houston, fourth largest in the country, we're not out there by ourselves. But in times like this, uh, I remember during Har Harvey, I was doing a lot of work with, with owners then, there was this sort of hesitancy to sort of pull back, sequester, hunker down, and not really do any m much or very little or no outreach to the folks around them. As a result, business today has uh, even the smallest business, the one or two one or two person enterprise, has a level of complexity associated with that that none of us or very few of us can do all things that are necessary at a world class level to ensure that we have a successful business. So it's the proverbial: there's so many um, spin, plates to keep spinning we're invariably going to let one drop. So as we are overwhelmed with the complexity of, it means, of what it means to run a very successful business, when it comes to customer acquisition or, or some other major, major decision, we accept anybody or anything. And, when we're, and as we do that, we run the risk of not working or interacting with our ideal customer. And as a result, we find ourselves in an un unenviable position of either being desperate, and that's why we take on those clients that don't fit because the phone rang and it was somebody that someone like they could use our service, and, of course, we're frustrated because if, we're, if we've done a great job of identifying who our ideal client is, the ideal client is someone who values what we provide, we get to work with them, and it brings us energy and joy when we work with them. If the clients we're working with aren't in that ideal space, like the picture shows, it, it can be quite frustrating. But there's an opportunity here. So you'll find out that I'm just a perpetual half uh, full glass kind of guy, and um, I see tons of opportunities here, uh, even though as we accelerate out of this pandemic, I think there's some opportunities here, and love to share those with you at this time. So I'm going to ask all of us to think a little bit differently about our business and those around us. So what we call this is uh, understanding the stakeholder or stakeholder analysis. So here we are at the top as the owners of our enterprises, but who is it that's also committed to helping us be successful? We have, there's our customers, there's our, there's our employees, there's our suppliers, there's our, the governmental entities, uh, regulation. I mean, think, think about it right now. Mo every business owner or most business owners, the government is an unbelievably helpful uh, stake stakeholder as they endeavor to provide the PPP, extended uh, uh, unemployment uh, benefits, uh, uh, other loans that are forgivable, and, and a variety of things. So, so as we accelerate out, the government most definitely is a key sta stakeholder in our success. So then c can community and society at large are, are huge st uh, uh, stakeholders in our particular enterprises because if you think about it, what is it that, that, that is often characterized, characterized as a thriving community or a thriving society? It's really around the health 
and well-being of the businesses that operate um, in those particular communities. So keep this picture in mind as we move throughout the presentation, and when we say stakeholders, this is what we're looking for, those people that are committed to our success as business owners. So in a perfect world, and you've got the right sets of stakeholders, it's a, it a, becomes a function of mutual aid, a bunch of folks pulling together for a common outcome, a common goal. And let's think about it. You as a business owner, yes, you are the recipient of the, your stakeholder community, but guess what? You are also the member of somebody else's stakeholder community. And so um, I would suggest and recommend think about that and figure out ways how you can be of mutual aid or aid or assistance to members of, you, of, of, of somebody else's stakeholder community. So the beauty of working together with folks outside of our organizations, uh, pay people who may serve the same audience that way we do but may not necessarily uh, compete, it's this whole concept of synergy where one plus one equals three. And I think uh, we, we can call it synergy, we can call it leverage, but it's getting more out of the one end of the funnel we get out more out of one end of the phone than we put into the other end. So think synergy as we think about uh, the role of our stakeholders. And when, when, when done well and we have a fully functioning, high-functioning business in the center of a very productive stakeholder community, it's like capturing lightning in a bottle. It just becomes magic. And it allows us to do things and create things that we probably could have never – Imagine, let alone um, experience, if we, were, if, we were, if we were going the road alone. So what's the big idea? The big idea here is collaboration. If we don't walk away with anything else today, think collaboration. Just like an orchestra that's rehearsed for months, if not years, to, be, to, to consistently be on the same page, be, the ability to create beautiful music to, together, so too should our, our businesses within our stakeholder networks be able to do the same. And since we are business owners, we're all looking for better outcomes. So our abil ability to engage, contribute, and extract from our stakeholder networks is going to give us the kinds of business outcomes that we're all looking for. And so we've got a lot of examples that, that, that are around there. I mean, if any of you belong to sort of a networking group or, or a chamber or some other professional association, think deeply uh, at, the, at the bottom of those or at the beginning of their vision, mission for, for existence, it's really helping its particular membership. So you're surrounded by all kinds of stakeholder opportunities just think, of, just to take a step back and think a little bit about broadly about again how you can contribute and how you might be able to benefit from being associated with a highly functioning stakeholder network. So, um, Robbie, let's uh, let's take let's take a, a moment here. I've probably done enough talking for for now, but uh, are there any questions that we see there in the uh, in the um, chat box, Robbie? Austin, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Uh, everyone, a reminder, use the chat, uh, send the question to the host, and uh, I will read them out to Austin. Robbie, I guess Austin, we're doing a pretty good job getting people's questions answered. There's no questions. Hey, okay. it's a first. No complaints. <laughs> no complaints. Good deal. All right, moving on. So as we begin, as we talk about st stakeholders, this uh, there's a, a few things I'd like you to take away from today, and these are sort of the what we like to refer to as the five key principles. Now, I assure you, there's probably, uh, if we thought long enough, we could we could probably spend half a day on this on this particular concept. But here's the top five that I'd like you to take away from today, um, as you go back and, and and work on your plans to accelerate from this pandemic. So, the principle number one is the concept of the mastermind. So I'm sure there's probably a few of us here on, on, the, on the line who have uh, either pe participated in the mastermind group or are familiar with mastermind group. There's a guy named um, Napoleon Hill. 
He wrote probably one of the finest business books of all time, a book called Think and Grow Rich, but he introduces the concept of the mastermind. And it's a very, very basic concept. And that concept is that as we come together, people of similar mind, similar purpose, we work together to help others create success either in their careers, their personal lives, or their business. So this is the whole concept of getting together with others and talking through your problems, your issues, opportunities, challenges. Um, on a personal note, I, um, I facilitate a mastermind group. We meet once a month. It's composed of uh, several CEOs who've uh, gone through the Goldman Sachs 10,000 program and um, we've been meeting um, a, a little over a year. Enough, in fact, I'm sorry, we're coming up on our one-year anniversary. And uh, I will tell you that the time we spend together, and it's only an hour a month, uh, pardon me, a couple hours a month, and it is absolutely magic. Uh, we're there to be a shoulder to one another when somebody needs it because they're having a tough time in their business or some part of their personal life. Uh, and more importantly, when uh, they share business issues and concerns, we as a group of six or seven people were able to come together and provide different points of view to help that uh, the, our, our fellow entrepreneur sort of develop a 360 view of a, the issue or concern that they're, that they're facing. So again, going back to how business really happens, you know, we're, we're operating in this ecosystem. And we talked about, the, we, we had an image earlier but I think this is a far better representation of what our stakeholder community uh, uh, really looks like. There's us in the middle, and those, those little nodes on this network diagram, those are all the folks that are committed to our success. And as I mentioned earlier, you too are part of somebody else's um, business ecosystem. So uh, it's great to, to gain, but it's also better to give. So uh, keep that in mind as we move forward. So the beauty of the mastermind approach, the ability to have others take a look or weigh in on what you're doing, what you propose to do, is this whole concept of core competency. Oftentimes, we're, we get so wound up in our business and what we do and what our original business plan, strategic plan is, we sometimes forget about the skills and knowledge that we're acquiring along the way and how that and when we build that competency, it could be deployed differently in the marketplace, maybe different from what we've, um, uh, what we've uh, originally thought. So the power of the mastermind is to help us understand that competency. Uh, we, we also use the mastermind for our help with our competitive assessments. Sure, it's, uh, it's great to go out there and um, understand what's going on in the marketplace, and maybe we can do some fundamental research. But oftentimes, or at least my experience has been, that the others in the room will have some great intelligence on uh, how our product or service lines up against the other providers in the marketplace. Because as we talked about in sales and uh, in our er earlier workshops, um, we're all pretty familiar with the concept of direct competitors. But where we often get tripped up is who are our indirect competitors and our functional competitors, and most importantly, who might our future competitors be? So I'm going to say two, I'll give you the company, when we talk about future competitors, I'm going to give you the names of two companies, and you can fill in the blanks about how, the, how that, uh, the, that competitive situation ended up. The first company, Blockbuster Video, and the second company is Netflix. Right. So Netflix, I'm not going to say Blockbuster didn't see Netflix coming because Netflix offered to sell themselves to, to to Blockbuster on two different occasions, but they never truly saw them as the competitive threat that they ultimately became. And uh, as they say, the, the rest is history. So the, um, again, your stakeholder group, your mastermind group can be an unbelievable resource of great intelligence. And so as we emerge from the pandemic, the question should, we should be all asking ourselves, we, we all know what business we're currently in, but the, the challenge is, what business could we be in? Um, anybody who's been uh, impacted a little or a lot from the, um, from the pandemic, either whether they're staying at home 
or the, the one of the fortunate few who are able to uh, are deemed an essential business and are able to and are able to go to work, uh, things have changed. Uh, some for the uh, some for the good and some for the, the the not so good. But in a discussion with your mastermind group, them understanding your core business, what business you're currently in, what your core competencies are, what you aspire to be, what you compet- your your actual and functional competitive space looks like, this can be a great way to generate some ideas and concepts about what businesses you can you could be in. Again, going back to my experience over the last year working with this group, uh, we've uh, have done an unbelievable job of working of helping one another identify new and um, uh, business opportunities uh, for our for our respective attendees. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those a little bit later in the presentation. In one of the associations I belong to, we read all of the applications for the uh, Houston Better Business Bureau, their uh, Pinnacle Awards program. And so the thing that I always like to joke about is when you ask one of the uh, business owners what's their differentiator, I would say that about 98.9% of the people who who, uh, complete the application, they respond with customer service is our differentiator. And so here's the here's the, the flip side of that. They, although they say customer experience is their differentiator, most of those same people did a better job of describing the technology that they're using in their business as opposed to what their this, this great customer experience that they're creating. What does that look like? So my lesson learned, my takeaway here is um, let's get real clear on what that customer experience is. If uh, if there is an opportunity there for you to distinguish yourself on customer experience, let's let's write it down, let's uh, document it, let's make it create a teachable experience so as new people come into our organization, we can teach them that. And who is the best person, and, and again, this is another powerful opportunity to expose your, your mastermind group to, is saying, hey, I want to be the best uh, let's say um, uh, commercial insurance agent in in the Houston area that services um, let's let's pick a, an industry that services um, home delivery florists. What do I need to do to create the kind of experience that would would help me stand out? That's a great question to pose to your mastermind group and for you to as as the collective to work on that because. Um, one of my other favorite terms is, you know, none of us is as smart as all of us. So that mastermind can be an unbelievably helpful, helpful group in um, in, in creating that um, experience. And finally, the most important thing, or one of the more important things that a mastermind group can provide, is helping us with clarity and focus. Uh, with without uh, clarity and and uh, of where we're headed and why we're heading it, it's really tough to uh, achieve any sustainable levels of success because we are we, we probably, without clarity it's, it'll be hard for us to focus on 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 certain things. Okay. Hey, uh, Robbie, I, I did have uh, I'm I'm looking at this chat room as well. I did have one question, and then uh, this question mm-hmm. is. You know, who, who typically makes up a, um, uh, a a mastermind group? So mastermind groups in all shapes, sizes, and flavors, right? And, um, you know, the one that I facilitate, like I said, these are all uh, members of the uh, Goldman Sachs uh, uh, 10,000 program. They all were, they were all in the same cohort together. And what's interesting about them is uh, they they're all – uh, what they share in common is a, is a strong desire to to grow their their business. Um, f- f- uh, fortunately, none of them are in competing businesses, and I think only one or two of them are in businesses that uh, complement one another. So that would be one one way to approach it. Um, the whole idea is, is when you form a mastermind group, it's got to be in such a way that people get value from it. So it might be that we have uh, a, a sprinkling of very of larger companies and a sprinkling of smaller companies, right? Or um, 
or um, small companies. Uh, but the, the challenge there is sometimes the, the larger companies don't get any value from, from working with the smaller companies. So uh, to get it right, it does take a little bit of a delicate balance. In my group, we probably – uh, turned over about two or three uh, business owners for a variety of reasons. But the, our core group now, if you ask them any time, they're getting great value of the ability just to come, to come to a session on a monthly basis and to be able to think out loud about what's working and what's not in their business. Robbie, was there any other uh, questions in the chat box? Yeah, I'll send that. I did one from a new owner. He's joining us for the first time. Um, actually, I don't know if it's a he or a she, but they're joining us for the first time, and uh, they've uh, basically said they have few part-time and full-time employees, and uh, how can I build up a mastermind group? Great question. Um, and probably the best way is to go back to – the best way to go is maybe go back to the uh, – the, uh, and, and these slides will be available to you, so, so don't worry about that, but go back to our slides – on uh, the stakeholder, what your stakeholder community is, and there, there's probably going to be some people there that are, again, committed to your success, and then your success, in turn, makes them successful. So it could be your, uh, uh, your banker, uh, maybe your accountant. It could maybe be, um, you know, somebody that you share a uh, professional association uh, with. Maybe you're in the, uh, in the Rotary or the Lions Club together. Um, you know, uh, it, in fact, it may not even be, be a, a business person. It could be maybe somebody from the uh, the acade uh, academic community who's got a keen interest in um, working with or at least having conversations uh, with uh, with business owners. So the uh, the the power of the um, so I, myself, I belong to chambers and belong to a few professional associations. And those are all very helpful for various networking activities. But I find that the work that we do inside of a mastermind group, where I have the opportunity in a smaller environment, again, to think out loud, and most importantly, for me to be able to ask questions in a confidential environment about what's, what's on my mind and get the benefit of, um, of, uh, get the benefit of, um, of their responses and input. So um, a long way of answering the question, but the short question is, is um, you know, if you have the opportunity to have the four or five brightest minds in business uh, in that room with you, um, who would that be? And then maybe if you can't get to them, who might be uh, a second or third choice uh, for that? So uh, I hope that, hope that helps a little bit. Okay. I'm going to grab a little water here. And um, we'll keep moving on, okay, Robbie? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, another way that this, you know, as we think about our, our um, again, accelerating out of the pandemic, it's our ability to to uh, explore or, and potentially capture uh, new new markets. I love that little goldfish. Uh, the ambition of that of that goldfish. You know, some of the basic ways of new geographies. Working with a client right now, um, they've been um, uh, toying with the idea for the last three to four years on moving into new geographies. Um, but what's happened is uh, their work in Houston, they've been very successful in the Houston area and uh, never really had a desire to, uh, probably had a desire, but didn't take, put the energy around moving into a new geography. So as they look out into the future, they see put some potential cracks in their Houston business. So now we're engaged uh, in a um, in a uh, process to take basically their existing competence, core competencies, their existing skill set, and just physically move or relocate the, that that offering to another area. Not going to change anything other than maybe the uh, address of where the invoices get sent. But they believe they're one of the, they're a company that has a, a, a service offering that um, plays well in other uh, communities. Similarly. Uh, uh, I'm uh, working with some other clients, and we're, we're, we're embarking on a segmentation opportunity. So for those of you who are students of marketing, you know, oftentimes what we see um, uh, particularly small businesses do, and, and large ones are guilty of this too, is we have a product or service offering, and we treat everybody the same. You know, we, we, we do the one-size-fits-all, right? 
that works for some certain products and services, but I'm a firm believer that there, within any population of customers or potential customers, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of unique needs that those people uh, are able to articulate. And for us as business owners, if we can capture some of that, we can create some great businesses for ourselves. So as you see here on this um, th this uh, conglomeration of folks, they're, based, they're all standing on basically a Venn diagram. And so each one of those overlap areas creates a new need, new uh, offering, new service potential based on the, the unique needs of that, partic uh, that particular group. So uh, when I was, uh, I was in an industry uh, that was horribly guilty <laughs> of one-size-fits-all, but through our, the strategy work that I was telling you about I did uh, earlier, we were able to cr create a number of segmentation opportunities. We were able to separate big customers from small customers. We went down some industry-focused um, paths as well. And over the course of about two or three years, because there was really dogged execution of the strategy, I can't take credit for the strategy piece, but uh, we, uh, that, that organization was really able to create some major league differences in that, in that really old and archaic industry because they had created this, uh, a seg gone down a segmentation path and created unique streams of value for chosen customers. So we went from a one-size-fits-all to uh, we're not right for everybody, but if you look like this and here's what your needs are, this could be the right solution for you. And then um, something um, as simple as uh, taking your existing services and, and repackaging and putting them in, in, in new bundles. So I was working with a client a few weeks back, and they had come to the conclusion that uh, their core offering was uh, too expensive or was relatively expensive for the typical uh, business owner that they were going after. So after a fair amount of discussion, we talked about the, the possibility to take their core offering and break it up into pieces. So we separated sort of the, um, the assessment piece from the ongoing recurring revenue piece. And what this did, this probably, um, in terms of an annual commitment, you know, the, uh, the, uh, it, it changed the economics dramatically. So if somebody wanted to do the sustaining piece themselves, a client, they could, they could do that, but they could, get the, they could buy separately the upfront uh, analytic assessment piece that uh, was very, very valuable, but had been previously bundled with uh, the other service offerings. So now with this uh, unbundling or, or rebundling of the, of the service offering, now they've got the ability to uh, expand the mar their, uh, their ideal marketplace because now they've got you know, both a bundled solution and an unbundled solution. So, Ravi, we're... We're moving right through. Any questions from the in the chat in the chat box? Austin, I'm not seeing none uh, at this time. Uh, unless they sent one to you directly, uh, I'm not seeing a question on my end right now. Okay, very good. I'll I'll just keep moving through here. Great. Okay. So we'll, I'm sure they're all coming at the end, right, Robbie? <laughs> yeah, it usually does. <laughs> And then another area that we want to think about is, um, is our business model, right? And so, so what is a business model? A business model is, is very simplistically two things. It's, you know, it, it answers the question how a company makes money, but uh, a little more succinctly is it's what are those, pro what are those services and processes that a company engages to build or develop its product or service offering and then the, then the second part of that is what is the, the processes or approach that a company uses to get those products and services into the hands of their ultimate customers. So if you think about it, uh, all four of these people, all four of these companies are retailers. Yep, Amazon, eBay, Walmart, and Salvation Army are all retailers, but they have very, very different business models. So Amazon pro probably owns very little, if any, of the things that they sell. They probably position themselves more as a online um, shopping or fulfillment platform as opposed to a retailer. But but they are in effect a retailer. 
Uh, similarly, uh, eBay, um, and, and guess what? All the Amazon, or, or probably 98% of, the, of what's sold on Amazon is brand new. Whereas we flip to eBay, um, similar to Amazon in terms of it's an uh, online platform, but um, the, the reverse is true. You know, most of the goods and services, the goods that they provide or, or facilitate are uh, previously or gently used or um, uh, more, more, and appeal more to hobbyists and that, and that sort of thing. Then we look at uh, Walmart. You know, as we know, Walmart and Amazon, are, they, they are in the battle because Walmart is, is amping up its online presence. But, uh, but again, still they play in the re- retail space, even though they're probably, they, they are in terms of revenue the number one retailer in the world, but they have a more traditional model in that they, um, they acquire products from a variety of manufacturers and producers around, around the world, bring them into a centralized di- distribution center, and then rely mostly on um, the people coming into the stores uh, to, uh, to, buy, uh, to buy the products, the, the products off, off the shelf. Now, of course, uh, both Amazon and Walmart continue to evolve their business model. Amazon, as we know, has bought Whole Foods Market, so now they've got an on-ground presence to complement their very, very strong online presence. And as we know, Walmart has um, uh, uh, really beefed up its o- uh, online presence over the last several years, making major acquisitions in foreign countries and, and that sort of thing. And, of course, um, I'm not sure, I can't speak for eBay, but then, they're all, but then they're all, they are all continuing to evolve their business models by how, by through delivery and home pick and, and pick up and so on and so forth. And then we have the Salvation Army, right? So yes, folks, they are they are a uh, they are a retailer, but uh, very unique in terms of their sourcing strategy. Their sourcing strategy is you and me, right? They wait in uh, in earnest for us to clean out our garage, identify or our closets, and identify things that no longer work for us and we contribute them to the thrift store. So, they're, uh, for, the, for those accountants out there, their cost of goods sold is minimal as compared to Walmart and an eBay and an Amazon. And then, um, then many of the people that shop at, at, uh, at, at the Salvation Army, again, going back to segment, segmenting a population, segmenting a customer base, these are folks that, that probably have two things, you know, looking for bargains, and then um, probably as importantly for most is uh, they buy into the mission of what the Salvation Army stands for in that uh, proceeds from the store sales and store receipts um, fund uh, uh, prof- uh, development programs for the, the um, less fortunate people in our community. And, of course, the stores also serve as a, tra- a training ground for some of their, uh, the people that they tend to and to, to get them back up on their feet um, and make them help them become uh, contributing members to society. So again, uh, four retailers with four dramatically different uh, business models. So as you, again, as we relaunch and um, our businesses, our enterprises, uh, the possibility of reworking, rethinking, reformatting your business model can be an unbelievably helpful exercise and uh, can. It, when done right, move you to that next level of exceptional performance. The other things to think about are new products and, and services. So um, how, how, how appropriate, you know, as we sort of are, are in some places, uh, some cities, some states, right in the middle of the pandemic virus, um, uh, pandemic, and things are not improving. So what did, what have some of, some uh, uh, folks chosen, companies chosen to do? So the picture on the left there, that is a, um, that's the piece of medical equipment that um, the um, I'm at a loss for words now. That is the the respirator, yes. That uh, um, that we're in such short supply. So what you're looking right there, that's a General Motors facility, right? And they chose to participate in the re- the pandemic response by uh, by uh, manufacturing these respirators. So too on the left hand on the right hand side is somebody who's sewing a, um, um, a mask. We know that um, you know, these are two products that have, just have unbelievable demand right now, given the situation, 
And I know for a fact, um, in fact, I met one of the members of my roundtable group, she's pivoted uh, a portion of her business to create masks. She was uh, engaged in the, the business of uh, providing some um, garments focused on uh, primarily on women. So she just kind of sort of reverse engineered the process, went back to her, her contract sewers, the people who provide her uh, material and fabric, and she placed an order for several thousand masks. And so now she's in the business of um, distributing masks in the greater Houston area. So uh, she found some new products and services. Now, will that continue after the, uh, um, the big pandemic scare is over? We don't know. It just depends on uh, what the market demand will be and what, uh, you know, what, uh, again, going back to our stakeholders, you know, what sort of regulations will, will uh, apply to people who go out in public? Will they be required or not required? To, to, uh, to wear masks as we move into the future. You know, as I talked about um, these two companies a little bit er earlier, uh, Blockbuster and Netflix. As I said, Netflix offered to sell themselves to Blockbuster on, on two different occasions. But if you think about it, at the end of the day, these folks, uh, these two companies are exactly the same in that they offer their, their customers the opportunity to view popular media, popular movies, um, on an on-demand basis. What made Netflix different, of course, you know, now that we have streaming and that sort of thing, Netflix chose to serve their customers differently. They, uh, um, they chose, and when, as you recall, when the, the service first started, they used the mail system to mail uh, DVDs, uh, to to, uh, to and from uh, the, the customers. They, they use the, um, uh, the mail system, and then ultimately they morphed into a, an online, uh, into the streaming service that they, that, they, uh, that they are now. And, of course, they continue to evolve, and now they're making, they've got their own studios and making their own movies. But go back 15, 20 years ago when they were just getting started, they were, they were in a head-to-head competition with Blockbuster, but the, the difference they made was they chose to serve their customers differently. So for those of you on, on, that are participating today, the questions I have for you, how might you keep your existing service but choose to serve your customer differently than what you may be what you are right now or differently from um, how others in your competitive space are, are serving their customers? Um, I really like this approach because in terms of um, – how you're making your sausage doesn't have to change much, but it's around how do we put it as we get it into the hands of our customers, what differences can they um, expect or will they experience as a way of serving them a little, little bit differently. So, Robbie, I've got a question here. Um, it says, uh, what, uh, are there any other uh, methods for um, evolving your service offering? And or your business enterprise, and, and, and the question is absolutely yes. Like I said earlier, we're only going to touch on a few things here, but uh, but something else to think, get thought to is the whole concept of uh, for, forward integration or backward integration. So uh, let's use let's use let's use Netflix as an example. So they they started out as a um, um, a, co a direct competitor to Blockbuster, uh, choosing to mail DVDs out as opposed to um, uh, having people come to a store. So they, they took that convenience factor to the next level. Then as they continue to evolve their model, what did they do? Then they, then they went to streaming services, right? So, um, again, so that was a game changer. That continued to put the, the distance between them and what was left of Blockbuster and probably some other folks around town. And, that, and so now as, we, as they kind of move into Netflix 3.0, they are now creating their own content. There's now the net studios with with a, with a ton of original programming, and so the opportunity there is they are no longer or not as beholden to the major studios as it relates to creating content. So now they can create content on their own. And um, and I will admit, I've been watching a little bit more Netflix uh, in the last few weeks than I have normally. And I got to tell you, some of those Netflix series are are, are, pr are pretty uh, pretty darn good. And um, so uh, so uh, so those so again so those would be sort of some other examples of maybe forward integration 
you know, Amazon both, both forward and and backwards integration to create a, a much much fuller, more in depth uh, offering. Okay, Robbie, if there's nothing else, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. Yes, um, nothing else for now. I've made a comment to um, share with the host or the presenter. So if you see any. Um, I'll keep an eye to see if we miss any, but we're good for now. Okay, good, 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 good. And so this next slide, we talk about the power of the pivot. And um, so all the slides we've shared and the conversations we've had up to this point support that, you know, ultimately we, 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 most of us or many of us will have to pivot our respective businesses as a result of the pandemic and the change in client behavior, customer behavior as a result. So as I mentioned to you earlier, I do a lot of work with the um, Houston Community College and their entrepreneurial initiative. In fact, as we speak, we're right in the middle of our business plan competition. So we had to take a, a brief pause in the middle because we were accustomed to every week getting together and having uh, you know 100 people in the room and talking through uh, various elements of their business plans and as they came together and that sort of thing. So. We were forced to pivot to an online because for, for, for obvious reasons, but um, and that, that came off without a hitch. But the biggest pivot was for, I would say, probably half of those uh, business plan participants ha were forced to adopt or enhance different parts of their, of their offering. And then there were several, there were several enterprises there that were, were counting on some sort of face-to-face -face interaction with their chosen customer group. And so now they had to pivot, again, pivot to, to an online model. And so the thing that I found you know, very, very interesting, because I'm really, really curious about business models and how owners think, it was that for most of them, when they pivoted, their business model, their offering, their business plan became dramatically better now that they were rethinking the business from more of an online uh, business. Because now instead of trying to figure out how do I capture attention or mind share among 4 million people in Houston, now they said, wow, as I pivot and take this online, I'm looking at substantially smaller uh, markets. But with smaller markets, you have an opportunity to really, really focus. And so um, several of these companies, as they test their new concept, uh, are, are probably getting better feedback and success from this pivot business model than they were from their original. So, uh, so when I talk about pivot, it's really as much mental as it is physical. Uh, it's what's going on between our our ears. It's, it's this whole mindset of, of growth. You know, we see some entrepreneurs who are so wedded to their idea. Um, let's just take for an example. Let's let's pick on Blockbuster Video. They were so wedded to the idea that uh, they were going to have a, literally, have a store on every corner in America, that the concept that something could disrupt their business, um, obsolete their business, was just a foreign concept to them. So when we talk about pivot, yes, there's a physical component, how will my business be differently, but it's also a mental concept, being open to the possibilities, uh, understand, being open to the possibility that opportunities are endless. They're only limited by the limitations we put on ourselves. And by being involved, being an active member in our respective um, ecosystems, our respective stakeholder groups, um, a mastermind, if you will, we have that, uh, that ability to help our, keep our minds open and open to, the, to the, the, the possibilities. Shall we just keep rushing through, uh, Robbie, or do, you, or do you have a question out there for us? Um, Austin, I did have a question, but uh, it was related to the business plan competition. I did answer it already. Um, just to be mindful of time, uh, please do continue. Okay, good. All right. I've got a few more slides. We'll wrap up. Um, okay, good. Thank, thank you. Yes. And then the, kind of the, the fifth principle of the five is uh, clarity and execution. So... The thing about entrepreneurs and great leaders is we, they, us, we get stuff done. 
So the first four slides, we did a lot of bit of thinking, a lot of bit, a lot of planning and positioning and that sort of thing. And I think that's great because I'm a firm believer that um, you know, let's not just go out, get out there and start doing stuff, but let's let's be thoughtful about what it is we're going to do. But don't be a victim of analysis paralysis. So once you've got a, a way forward that, that something that that may you think may work. That's uh, that's relevant to the needs of the of the community as we power through the, the pandemic. Let's let's get in the execution mode and start making some things happen. Because as we showed earlier, as we talked about our the ecosystems that we operate in, other people want to help. Others want to see you succeed. Because the reality of it is, if you succeed, then they they too succeed. So lots of help out there. And if you think about what the, the HCC and the entrepreneurial ni initiatives, um, everything is available there at little or no cost to aspiring entrepreneurs or even ex even existing um, uh, uh, business owners. So there's lots of resources out there. So as I was talking, was sharing with one of my clients earlier today, it's great to think through these challenges, these opportunities, um, chart a new way forward. But if you want to in dramatically increase the success of you achieving that, of those, uh, those desired outcomes, write it down. Create a game plan. I'm not talking about a 40 or 50-page document, but r take two or three pages of notes and be clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish and why you are. As you write it down, your thinking gets dramatically clearer, and when it's written down, it's easier to enlist other members of your team, other members of your stakeholder group, because when they see something that's written, that it's one of the best indicators that you're really, really serious about the new way forward. Okay. So um, that's going to be our final slide here. We're going to get into a little bit of uh, – so if there's any questions, Robbie, just go ahead and shoot them over. But I just want to do a real quick, quick recap. So we talked about the five key principles as it relates to stakeholders. Uh, wrong slide. Let me get to the next slide. Okay. Oh, we got a little error there. But the, the but the key ones being your your, your stakeholder group and the, being able to pivot, thinking through new ideas, new concepts that are going to support your business going forward. And then as we gather takeaway items, uh, just a r reminder. Again, this webinar series is supporting. Um, a workshop series, a business building workshop series that's going to be hosted by Houston Community College, I mean the uh, corporate college within HCC. And um, here is their contact information if they're, for those of you who desire to get more information or at least to put your name on the, on the list. We're starting to put, to put the workshop together as we speak. Uh, they're uh, collecting a list of names of people who, who are interested, in a, and as I mentioned, um, the the financial commitment on your part is going to will be minimal, but uh, the outcome is going to be uh, ex extremely great. So we definitely encourage you to do that. So uh, again, so as we wrap up, um, here is my contact information. Oh, I'm sorry. Next week uh, will be number five in this series, and we're going to talk about right sizing and prioritizing your expenses. So I'm sure a number of you are probably already down the path of this since we've been in the pandemic mode for five or six weeks. But I invite you to join us next week and talk a little bit more strategically about how we right-size and prioritize our expenses. Uh, hopefully we'll have a few ideas and concepts that maybe you've not thought about, um, and we'll also talk about how we might bring our, our respective networks, our uh, stakeholder group, into, into the conversation as well. So uh, there's my contact information. If anybody would like to uh, reach out, if you have any other questions you'd like to take offline, uh, Robbie, we'll, within the next uh, what, uh, week or so, we'll probably have these slides in the – will they be in the library for people to access? Or? Yeah, so a lot of these slides will be made available on hccs.edu slash small business. I'll, I'll go ahead and put this in the chat. Uh, we are kind of – holding on to them until all seven of the webinar series are done so we can encourage people to come and listen to you live uh, before we publish all seven. Okay. Uh, but we will be uh, sharing the video recordings and the slides uh, for all seven uh, of the series uh, on hccs.edu uh, forward slash 
small business. Again, I'll put that in the, in the chat. All right, everybody. Um, I just uh, want to thank Austin once again for for the uh, for, uh, the the fourth resiliency workshop here, and uh, being mindful of time here. We've got about three minutes on this session, so I'll I'll go ahead and stop the recording, Austin, so I can um, make sure that uh, uh, we we get this uh, started. Uh, all of you uh, look forward to seeing uh, next Thursday at noon for the fifth. Business Resiliency Workshop uh, with Austin Tanet. And uh, what's the next topic, Austin? Remind me. We're going to talk about strategic um, uh, prioritizing expenses. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, exactly. All right. So look forward. If you haven't already registered, uh, you'll find the registration link on the uh, Small Business website for HCC. And uh, again, this is free, so I encourage more people to, to join in. And uh, feel free to reach out to Austin it's on the on the slide there. Um, Austin, I believe your your cell phone, so people can call and text you. That's that that's correct. Uh, feel, feel free. Happy to, to be a resource. If you have any questions or about your particular enterprise or a, a unique situation you're having, happy to, uh, to to plug in and be a resource to you. Robbie, I want to thank you again for uh, for being such a gracious host and working uh, with me on this. And I want to thank our audience for giving up a few minutes of their time today to participate in something that I believe is very, very worthwhile. Excellent. All right, everybody, have a great day. This session is going to end in a, about a minute. Austin, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Robbie. Take Bye care. Bye for now.